Are you ready to jump into some scripture, everybody? All right, if you would stand with me, let's read our passage for today, and we'll pray and get into it. Familiar few verses, Matthew chapter number 5, verse number 13, we are finished with Romans 8, so we're going to read from Matthew 5, 13, 14, 15, and 16. Here's what it says. Jesus is speaking. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Verse 14. You, somebody say you, are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. This little light of mine. Come on, somebody. Whoever that was needs to come to growth track in a couple of weeks and join the worship team because you were on it. So they don't put a light under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand. They raise up the light, right? Uh, And it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your, somebody say your, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. Holy Spirit, just as you inspired people to write your word and record what Jesus said, I pray that you would illuminate your word. Help us to see your word clearly today. Help us to understand your word in a fresh way, Lord, and let us apply your word in a new way, in a fresh way, in a powerful way to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Somebody help me say amen Amen. and amen. Look over at somebody as you're seated and tell them you're the light of the world. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. (laughs) Do you know why I'm an Astros fan? Let's just go back a few minutes. My mind goes in all different directions. You know I'm an Astros fan? Because I'm from Houston. I mean, that just, that makes sense, right? If I was born somewhere else, I'd probably be a fan of whatever bad team they have. (laughs) But I didn't just become an Astros fan like the last five years since they've been good. I was an Astros fan when they weren't good. I was an Astros fan when they were losing 100 games a year. It was really fun to be a fan in some ways because you could go to a game for like $6. Have you looked up the price of these tickets now, right now? The worst seat in the house is 600 The worst seat in the house. You got a better view on your couch. But I'm an Astros fan, long time. Now, I'm not a Texans fan, because when I was born, they were the Oilers, and I'm still, I still like, you know, love you blue and all that. But anyway, I could be a Texans fan if they get a new owner. But anyhow, but I'm an Astro, because I'm from Houston. I'm a Rockets fan, because I'm from Houston. We got a hockey team, man. Remember the Arrows? I'm going to be an Arrow. I'm going to be a hockey fan. I'm a Dynamo fan. Why? Because I'm from Houston. You know, and and, and I'm going to make a point. I'm going to make a point. I'm not just celebrating the Astros, although we are. (laughs) But where you're from has a lot to do with how you view the world, right? Um, The family that you're raised in, the neighborhood that you're raised, the schools that you go to, we could say it this way, the environment that is around you as you're being raised or the environment that raises you have have a lot to do with who you are. Not everything, right? DNA has a lot to do with things. God has a lot to say about things. But in many ways, we are products of our environment. The way we talk. We have accents, right? Uh, the, The way we think, the way we view the world. There's something in like philosophical terms and, and some religious terms called a worldview. And, and your worldview is like if I had a pair of glasses that were, uh, I don't know, it, it's, 
costume time, right? So say I had a pair of glasses with a red lens. Well, when I put those glasses on, everything is red, right? And so in, for the illustration, your worldview is the lens by which you see the world. All of us, uh, by the environment that raises, we have a lens that we wear, and it, it colors the way that we see the world. And where we're raised, how we're raised, who raises us, has a lot to do with the way we view things and feel about things. And sometimes that's for the good, and sometimes that's for the bad, right? And one of the hardest things that we'll ever do in life as individuals is, is try to change the way we were raised. You can't go back in time, but change the way it affected our mind or change the way it affected our emotions or change the way it affected our speech, right? One of the most difficult things we do is to overcome the negative repercussions for the environment that raised us. You know, a really good work, a worthy work of ministry, but a really difficult work of ministry is trying to help people overcome the negative things that are a part of how they were raised because those things that are a part of us from the day we're born are so ingrained in us, we don't recognize them. It's, that lens is like glued to our face and there's, it's really hard to see it another way. But it's good work, right? It's worthy work because in some ways, all of us ha- have some negative ramifications of the environment that raised us. And so it's good to look at your life and say, okay, I know they loved me, but what they taught me in this area was not wise, it wasn't good, and I need to fight, I need to overcome. It's hard, it's hard to do, but it's good work, it's it's worthy work. In many ways, we are the products of our environment. And a good thing is to try to overcome the negative parts of that. Here's a better thing, maybe the best thing we can do. The best thing we can do is change the environment, right? It's good work. It's worthy work to try to undo the negative, uh, you know, effects of our environment, but it's better work to rise up and say, I won't allow what shaped me in a negative way to shape my kids in a negative way to shape my grandkids in a negative way or to, or to just shape the next generation. If, if I can, stand up and do my part to change the environment, that's better work. Because then that means in 20 years that kid doesn't have to process out the same stuff you're struggling to process out, right? It's, it's better work. It's good work to overcome. We all have to do that. But it's better work to stand up and, and say, I won't allow this to be perpetuated in my family or in my home or in my community or in my city or you know, in the environment around my family. And so here's kind of our big idea for today, and we're going to talk towards this for the rest of the day. And and it's this idea that the environment shapes us, but we are, the church is called to shape the environment. See, we think we're like lost in it. Well, it's just, it is what it is. But the reality is the church was never called to just be a bystander in the world. But no, the church was called to rise up in influence, rise up in distinction, rise up in the power of the Holy Spirit and make a difference in the world around us. Pastor Steve has said uh, for as long as this church has existed that if we represent Jesus in this community, this community should be better because we're here. Why? Because we have an influence on this community or we should. We're called to. And the best work is to recognize that things don't have to stay the way they are. That I have a part to play in shaping The world, the church is called to shape a neighborhood, a community, a city, a nation. It's what the church has done throughout all of history. The the greatest art in history are on the walls and ceilings of churches all over the world. Famous artists' greatest works are on the walls and ceilings of churches all over the world. Most of the hospitals around the world have some Bible character's name because the church advanced health care and advanced the medical field. All of the great Ivy League universities in the world 
started as seminaries for preachers and ministers and because the church advanced education throughout the world. The idea of human rights is a Judeo-Christian idea, the idea that people have value, intrinsic value, just because you're alive, you're valuable. That wasn't an idea that is as old as time. That's an idea that came about through the influence of the church. The church all throughout history, hey, the, the biggest epics, you go back really recent of the 20th century were the Ten Commandments. And movies like that uh, uh, in the mid-1900s, the biggest money movies were Bible-inspired, church-inspired. What we believe about marriage, what the world believes about marriage, what the world believes about family, what the world believes about, and I mean throughout history, I know things are, a lot are changing, and I'll explain why I think in a minute, all of those things have been shaped and influenced by the church. But the problem is, we've outsourced our influence. This church that has literally shaped the world in all of these major areas, and in every major area, now we sit back and we let Hollywood make the art and influence our culture. We sit back and we let politicians dictate our morality. We've outsourced our influence and, and we've comfortably taken a seat on the fringes of society where we gather together on Sunday and lament just how bad everything is as if we don't have a role to play in the world. But we do. At least we're supposed to. We're called to. The church was never supposed to sit on the sidelines in its salvation and just gripe about how bad the world is. The church is supposed to be shaping the world, influencing the world, changing the world, making a difference in the world. And this is what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 5. The context of this salt and light message is in the Sermon on the Mount. He's preaching, it's his longest continual sermon, but he begins with what are called the Beatitudes. Now, the word Beatitude means blessing. And he says uh, about eight or ten statements, you're blessed when, or the blessed who, and he talks about various attitudes of believers. And, and what Jesus is really preaching is very countercultural because he talks about blessed are the people who mourn. That doesn't sound like blessed people, right? Blessed are you when people persecute you. And he goes through this list of Christian attitudes and he says, whereas everyone else might consider you cursed when you have these attitudes or when you're in these circumstances, in the kingdom of God, things are different. And so he really introduces this countercultural message of influence on the world and influence by the way we're aligned, the what we believe, how we respond, how we react, how we act in a world should be different from the world. And so he leads in from that, he leads into the passage we just read, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. So this countercultural message, this idea that you're supposed to be different leads him into saying, you're salt and you're light. And what I see in this passage is what I'm calling two responsibilities of the church in the world. Two responsibilities of the church in the world. Now, who is the church? It's us. Look at your neighbor and say, it's us. So these are our responsibilities in the world, to the world. The first one is, I'm just going to use one word, distinction, distinction, distinction. We have a responsibility to be distinct from the world. That's what Jesus is saying. Um, salt, to, not to get, and I don't understand ancient history, but a little bit of history, before refrigeration, like before you could throw about a half a pound of ground beef in your fridge, they used salt to preserve meat, among other uses. 
As a matter of fact, this was the major use, though. They used salt more for this purpose than for flavoring food. The, the primary use for salt in this day and age was preservation. It was the precursor to refrigeration. Salt was incredibly valuable. Salt, in many ways, was more valuable than the meat it preserved. You, you go to work and you get a salary. The word salary comes from the ancient Greek and Roman words for salt because many times people were paid in salt. They took their salary in salt because salt meant preservation. It meant what I spend my money on will last longer. I'll be able to feed my family for longer. Everything won't be wasted. What salt meant was life to a family. It meant fresh meat, fresh food. So Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. He also says, you're the light of the world. We all know what light does, right? What does light do? It lights. <laughs> it illuminates. Now, here's the thing, though. Jesus is not just saying something about the church here. He's telling the church, you are salt and you are light. But he's not just making a statement about the church. He's, he's directly saying to the church, you're salt and you're light. But he's also indirectly defining the world. And the way he defines the world is very different from the way he defines the church. He says, you are the salt of the earth. Well, in this context, you know what that means? It means he's saying that the earth is rotting. That the earth needs preservation. He says, you're the light of the world. So he's saying the church is the light. But what's he also saying about the world? That the world is dark. That the world needs light because it's dark. The world needs salt because it is decaying. Remember our, our, our verse in Romans 8, 21. We, we talked about it a few weeks ago. Paul said, creation itself will be liberated from its what? Bondage to decay. Decay is an appropriate word for the world. It's, it's the way Jesus describes the world and brought into the freedom and the glory of the children of God. So what I'm saying is, in G, from Jesus' perspective, there's a difference between the church and the world. And the power of the salt and the power of the light is that it stands in contrast to the rotting meat and to the dark room. I think one of the responsibilities we have as the church is to be distinct from the world. Is to stand in contrast to the world. Now that sounds like we stand in opposition. I'm not saying in opposition. I'm saying we stand in contrast. That there is a distinction. Just the way Jesus described. Because what the world doesn't need is more rotting. More decay. What the world doesn't need is more darkness. The world needs something different. And the power of the salt, the power of the light, the power of the church is in, number one, it's distinction. That it's different. You don't preserve rotting meat by putting more rotting meat on it. You got to put something different on it. The second responsibility of the church in society, it's not just that we're distinct, but number two, our second responsibility is that we have influence, is that we have influence. The salt can be as salty as it wants to be, but if it never comes in contact with what it's supposed to influence, then it serves no purpose. If the salt stays in the shaker, then it ser does not serve its purpose. It can be as distinct as it wants to be, but if it never touches the meat, it does not serve its purpose. The light can be as bright as it wants to be, but if it's hidden under a bowl, it does no good for anyone. And so the power of the salt and the power of the light are number one in their distinction, but not distinction alone. The second way that the salt and the light are powerful is that it has influence on what it's distinct from. The salt's not sitting in the shaker talking about how terrible it smells with that rotting meat. 
The light's not under the bowl talking about how dark it is out there. I'm glad we're in here. Because what good are they until they influence, until the salt touches the meat, until the light touches the darkness, until the church touches the world? See, there are a lot of people in a lot of churches, and, and I, don't, I don't take shots at churches. Man, I believe in the church. I love the church, and we're all going to get some things wrong. Hopefully, we get more right than we get wrong, and uh, we're going to get to heaven and find out we were wrong about a lot. So I'm not knocking churches. I'm not knocking people in church this week. In a day and age where it's easier to stay home than ever, I applaud people who get up and come to church wherever they go to church. So let me say that before I say what I'm about to say. But what we can do if we're not careful, and I say we intentionally, is that we can come together in this room like a salt shaker, or we can come together in this room like a big bowl over our light and just talk about how bright we are and how dark it is out there and how salty we are and how bad it is out there and never walk out of here and hold our light high and never walk out of here and let the saltiness of Jesus in us, the Holy Spirit in us, influence the world around us. And we can be as distinct as we want to be in here. We can talk about how we disagree with this, that, or the other, but if we never leave this place and influence the world, then we're not serving our purpose. We're distinct, but we don't have power. We're distinct, but we don't have influence. And what happens when there's a vacuum? Somebody else fills the vacuum. The church didn't just one day say, okay, we don't want influence anymore. No, the church just got really proud of its distinction and forgot we're supposed to bring our distinction out of the room and influence the world. So Hollywood filled the vacuum and the media filled the vacuum and politicians have filled the vacuum and everybody else has more influence than we do and it's our fault. We have a responsibility to be distinct, but then beyond that, we have a responsibility to carry our distinction, to carry our Christianity into a world that needs us. They may not recognize they need us. You know, here's the thing about darkness. You can't see your chains in the dark. The world doesn't know they need us, but we know they need us. And yet here we are in the shaker, under the bowl, letting society do what it does when we have the answer. So how in the world, how in the world do we influence the world? Because that's the calling. How do we influence the world? I'm going to give you three ways. Number one, we don't do it alone. We don't do it alone. See, we are, we are, and I think this is important to remember, especially if you're new to Christianity. Alone, we are Christians, but together, we're the church. Christianity is not a solo player sport. It's a team sport. We need each other. Nothing in the New Testament says you're saved, now go hide somewhere by yourself. No, it's get in community, gather. Don't forsake the gathering together. We need each other, right? And so if we're going to influence the world, we're not going to do it alone. And Jesus is not calling us to do it alone. The verse we read just a little bit earlier, Matthew 5, 16, his encouragement is, he says, you're the salt, you're the light. He says, let your light shine. Well, that word your, if you study it out, it's a plural your. It's not a singular your. So if Jesus was from Houston, he would say, let y'all's light shine. Right? It's, it's a plural. It's y'all. It's not your. It's not you. It's y'all. Let y'all's light shine shine. He's talking to a group. He's not talking to one person. He's talking to the disciples. He's talking to believers. He's talking to the church. 
And this is comforting because God's not calling me by myself to walk out in the world by myself and change the world. That's not the way God intends to get this done. No, God's called me to the church, a Christian to the church. And as the church, we walk out into the world together and we preserve and we illuminate, we influence the world together. If I'm by myself, my reach is small, but if we together rise up in distinction and rise up in influence, oh, the difference that we could make. So how in the world do we influence the world? Number one, we don't do it alone. Number two, we have to protect our distinction. We have to protect our distinction. The goal is to influence, not to be influenced. You know, what Jesus said here is a weird thing to say, specifically about the salt. Because salt doesn't lose its saltiness, ever. You have salt, you can leave it on the shelf for a hundred years. Your great grandkids, it'll still be salty. And so this is potentially one of those phrases where he talks about a camel going through the eye of a needle, you know, it's kind of an exaggerated phrase. Or another option is that Jesus is talking about salt that has been contaminated. When it's no longer pure, when it's no longer distinct, it's no longer powerful. And we have a responsibility to the world to protect what makes us different. Not to lord it over people, not to treat people as if we're better than them, but to maintain and value the distinction that Jesus brings into our life. You say, well, Chase, what is that? Well, if your life is lined up with the word of God, you will be distinct from the world in what you believe and how you respond to situations and how you spend your time and where you base your morality. And it's important that we influence without being influenced without becoming contaminated because salt, when it loses its saltiness, when it loses its power. And the world needs a powerful church. We're talking about influencing the world. We gotta have the power of God. And a big part of that is our distinction. We're different. And it's our difference that makes the difference. You want to make a difference in the world? You got to be different from the world. Rotting meat doesn't need more rotting meat. Doesn't change anything. A dark room doesn't need more darkness. Doesn't change anything. It's the distinction that makes a difference. And, and I believe we have to value our distinction. We have to protect our distinction. Y you need to get in your Bible and let your Bible shape the way you think, the way you believe, the way you react. The way I'm serious because that's not just an old book with old values. That is an eternal book with eternal values. And it's still good for today. And it's still powerful for today. And the world doesn't recognize their chains in the darkness, but the word is light. And the word, the values espoused in the word, if we pick them up and we live them out, will absolutely change the world. So if you want to reach the world, change the world, influence the world, number one, we don't do it alone. Number two, we, we have to protect our distinction. And number three, we have to boldly, somebody say boldly, we have to boldly live what we believe for the world to see. We have to walk out of this room and still be Christians. We have to, on social media, still be a Christian. 
We have to at work still be a Christian. We have to at school still be a Christian. We have to in our home still be a Christian. In our marriage still be a Christian. With our kids still be a Christian. We're not gonna change the world if what we believe is only for this room and no other room, but we're supposed to take what we believe into every facet of society. Do you know how we impact arts? We take what we believe into the arts. Do you know how you impact healthcare? Take what you believe into the medical field. Do you know how you impact politics? Take what you believe into politics. That's the call. You say, oh, the church shouldn't get involved. No, no, no. If we're going to shape the world, we have to get involved. We need Christian businessmen and businesswomen. We need Christian politicians, real Christian politicians. We need Christian moms and dads and teachers. We need Christian influencers on social media. We need more people who boldly live what they believe. We can't believe on Sunday and then approach the world the way the rest of the world is approaching the world. We have to be distinct and we have to bring what makes us distinct into contact with the world. Well, I don't wanna be different. That's what makes you powerful. It's your distinction that gives you influence. It's your distinction that gives you the potential for changing your community, changing your city, changing our nation, changing our world. You know what I don't like? And I I get this a lot, so just maybe this will help, maybe this won't. People who complain about what we do at church, but don't help at all. Like, well, dang. We, maybe we could do better if you would jump in. If you would tithe, if you would give, if you would serve. Like, because if somebody comes and tells me how bad we're doing, I'm going to tell you, let me just, can I say too much? I'm saying, Margaret, what do they give? Because you don't have influence if you're not invested. And we can't be a church that sits around just griping, just complaining, and we don't get out there and get involved. That's not the point. This is not about Sunday morning. It's about every day of the year. Ephesians 1, 20 through 23, this is the message version, so it's a paraphrase, but I I love the language. It says, all this energy issues from Christ. God raised him from death and set him on a throne in deep heaven, in charge of running the universe, everything from galaxies to government. So you see the picture. Jesus is on a throne and he's running everything. From galaxies to governments, no name and no power is exempt from his rule. And not just for the time being, but forever. Remember, we taught through this in Daniel 7 a few months ago. He's in charge of it all. He has the final word on everything. Watch this. So Jesus is in charge of the whole world. And at the center of everything... At the center of galaxies and governments and power and people and names and fame and money and riches. At the center of everything we think is powerful. Christ rules the church. See, the church is not like sidelines in God's plan for the world. The church is on the field. The church is in the middle of it all, supposed to be. The church, you see, is not peripheral to the world, not sideline to the world. As a matter of fact, if you want to make the comparison, the world is supposed to be sidelined to the church. Watch this. This is powerful. The church is Christ's body. Oh, I want God to change my community. I want God to change the climate at my job. The church is Christ's body. And through his body, he speaks and acts and fills everything. 
with his presence. See, God, God, God wants to change your neighborhood, but he wants to use you. God wants to change our, our community. He wants to change our nation, but he, he wants his body to stand up, leave the salt shaker, and get out there and, and, and speak and act and bring his presence everywhere that we go. We have a call that we've been ignoring. There's been a vacuum of influence, and by defaults, other people have filled the vacuum. But our place isn't on the sideline, church. Our place is on the field. There isn't a field in society that the church is not supposed to inundate. Because the church is not just a subset. The church is at the center of it all. And the church is supposed to influence and impact every thing. So we've got to be a strong church. If we are shaped by our environments, man, we got to have a church with strong environments. And you know what? Can I, can I toot our horn for a minute? Y'all, it's hot in this jacket. Can I take it off? Will they win? Have I done, have I done my part for the Astros? I am sweating. Thank you, sir. God, I'm about to pass out up here. Toot our horn and then fall out. This church has been an influential church for 28 years in this community. People know about this church. This church has impacted this community for 28 years. Through block parties, through harvest festivals, through Sunday services, through generosity, through your generosity. For 28 years, this community is better because we're here. This community would be worse if we're not here. Now, can we do more? Yes. Will we do more? Absolutely. But let's, let's talk about influence. This church has been influential for 28 years, and a lot of y'all have made it happen. And I want to take just a moment and give a nod to the past and say thank you for all that you've done because our community is better. People are saved. Families are saved. Marriages have been restored. People have been fed. People have been clothed. Young ladies are learning how to have careers and raise kids through Gabriel's house. Even as we speak, this church is a difference-making church. This church is not about Sunday morning and then let the world go to hell Monday through Saturday. We've made a difference and you've made it possible. But let me just tell you, as much as we've done, we can't sit back on what we've done and just, okay, we've done our part and then become a church that just gripes about how bad everything is without feeling like we can get out there and make a difference in this world. And so every year at the end of the year, we receive a big offering called Champions Give. And it's going to happen in December. And what Champions Give does, it's an offering that we give over and above our regular tithing, our regular giving. Because our tithing largely is for the operation of the church. But our offerings over and above the tithe move the vision of the church forward. They make ministry happen. They they got Gabriel's house open. They've done block parties throughout the years. I mean... Champions give is a shot in the arm. And so I want to just take the last five or ten minutes that I have and talk about not just what we've done, but what's on the horizon for our church because our best days are still ahead of us as a church. They have to be. They have to be. They have to be. Hey, in, in just the last few years, with Champions Give, we've been able to completely redo this room. Isn't this room cool looking out, just fresh and, you know, and, and we had a great room before, but 17 years later, you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta fix some stuff, change some stuff, replace some stuff. And 
not enough comes in week to week for us to be able to do floors, buy chairs, paint walls, because tithing and regular giving covers the operation, pays the salaries, pays the light bill, pays the electric. It takes about $100,000 a month to run this place, just the operation of this place. And the bulk of that is not salaries, I promise you. But Champions Give has allowed us to move forward in ways that we couldn't otherwise. Just this year, you may not have noticed, but we, were, we recently installed about 30 video cameras around this campus for safety, for protection, so that in case anything ever happens, we have a record of it and, and we can track people down. There's four in this room, you can't see them. There's one there, there's one there, two on the back. Well, there's 30 around the campus. We don't have money to put video cameras in week to week. You made that happen. You're safer today because people give offerings over and above their tithe. Because of Champions Give, we completely updated our Champions Kids area in recent years. Totally new, totally fresh, new televisions, brand new curriculum. And uh, our kids are better for it. Every week now I hear people, parents telling me, our kid loves it. They don't want to leave. They don't want to leave. Ellis loves it. He walks in by himself now. The first few weeks, he wasn't real sure. But now when we get here, class, 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 class. Because you know what? I want to create environments for those kids that shape them the way they think, the way they talk, what they believe. And Champions Give makes that possible, that it's clean, that it's safe. We're able to move the check-in area, buy new check-in equipment. All of that happens not through the regular operational giving, but through offering giving, Champions Give giving that allows us to move the church forward and move the vision and the mission of the church forward. This year through Gabriel's house, we opened Gabriel's house in January of 2021. We have been able to serve five young ladies with kids in Gabriel's house. Five young ladies. Now that's with kids and everybody. That's 15 people that have been living at Gabriel's house since January. Some have come, some have gone. But these are young ladies that needed to, needed to get a career and needed to, some of them get an education, needed to just get stable, not bad young ladies. I'll tell you, this is the most exciting part. Most of them are in the room right now. They've all become a part of our church, most of them. We baptized three of them over the summer. These are, these are part of our family. This is, they're, they're, and I would never embarrass them, not that they would be embarrassed, but I think if they could tell you this church has made a difference in my life, they would say this church has absolutely made a difference in my life. Three of those young ladies by the end of the year will have graduated a trade program in the career of their choice. Put it, setting themselves up for a better future for them and their kids. That's happening right now. And let me just tell you that 100,000 I mentioned, it doesn't cover Gabriel's house. That was before we opened that building. Offerings, champions give things like this that move the vision forward are what make that possible. And you're making it possible. Here, here's my favorite one. Well, I don't know. Those are all pretty good. But if you think about this, two years ago for champions give, 2019, I really felt strongly, and I'll say God, I'm always hesitant to say God told me, but now that I look back, I know God told me. And I felt strongly that for Champions Give, we need to save one month of expenses. It's $100,000. And that's not exciting to get up here and try to say, guys, I want y'all to get excited. We're going to save one month of expenses. <laughs> but I really felt strong. So we did. And we didn't quite reach our 100000 but we got a good portion of it. And by mid-March, the world shut down. And I thought, oh, God, what, what if I would have said, no, we need something more exciting? We wouldn't have that cushion 
to get us through a worldwide disaster. What I'm saying is champions give throughout the years. This end of the year offering, these special kind of offerings throughout the years have been used by God to protect us and to move the church forward, to keep us influential in the world. And so champions give this year. Here's what we want to do. We want to do four specific things, four specific things. Number one, we're going to expand Champions Kids. I told you just recently, we've redone those rooms. You know, the church itself, we're at about 50% attendance from pre-COVID. And that's in the room. I know a lot of people watch online, but about 50% attendance. But Champions Kids is at 100%. Can you believe? I mean, that's, that's true. So when the rest of y'all come back, we'll have an army of children. Which is good, right? It's a healthy church. It's a good church. But here's what we need to do. We need to add two classrooms. Right now, they're being, one's being used for nothing. It's where we used to do check-in, and the other's being used for storage. And what I want is for these rooms to not get overcrowded so that every kid has the same good experience to worship, to learn about Jesus, and to play. And so we're going to add two rooms. Those rooms are going to cost $7,500 each. That doesn't come in week to week. Champions Give is going to help us get there. That's what we hope to do. The other thing we're going to do with Champions Give, and this is another $7,500, is we're going to turn the conference room over there by the offices. If you have kids, you check your kids in, and you walk them into the hallway. The door right to the left of the door you walk to get back there where the classrooms are is our conference room. We're going to turn that room into a sensory room so that we can better serve families and children with special needs. Because that's, that's an area that we have struggled throughout the years and we have passionate people and passionate teachers and we want to be able to serve families so that moms and dads with children with special needs can feel good about dropping their kids off over in Champions Kids to know that they are getting the same opportunity as every other child to worship, to learn about Jesus and to play. That's Champions Give. That's the first thing. Second thing we're going to do is um, we're going to completely, what we've done in this room, we're going to completely do in the youth auditorium just over on this side of the campus. It's right over here. That room, and if you haven't been over there, uh, just sneak, sneak on over if you want to after service. That room has been used to reach I would say tens of thousands of people in the last 17 years we've been on this campus. Tens of thousands, tens of thousands. Tens of thousands of meals served for free. Most recently, last year, it, that room was kind of the home base of our food bank operations. And here's what I'll say, and if you go sneak over there and look, matter of fact, Mel, turn the lights on over there. It's a mess. We're using it for storage. And you're going to walk in there and say, man, this room is rough. And it is rough because it's been used. I mean, it has been, if any room around here has been used, that room has been put through its paces. But I don't feel good about a big open room. I don't feel good about an auditorium being a storage room. I don't feel good about scratched up floors and torn up carpet. We're going to completely overhaul that room and make it look like a smaller version of this room. We're going to polish the concrete. We're going to redo the stage. We're going to put new lights in. We're going to, you say, Chase, why are you doing all that? I'm getting there. Because as soon as that room's done in February or March, we're going to launch, relaunch a midweek student service, a midweek youth service that's going to serve middle school and high school students right here. And it's going to be done well. It's going to be done excellently. They're going to have a space they can be proud of. And this is not going to be some, some subset of the church. I'm going to preach it. Pastor Matt's going to preach it. The worship team's going to lead worship. It's going to be a full-fledged service for youth, middle school, and high school. And we're doing it during the week because we want to, number one, put all of our attention on it. On a night, we're not doing all of this, right? 
So we can focus on it, number one, and then number two, because I want your students serving. I want them making church happen on Sunday. I want them running cameras, teaching kids, working the cafe, and that's going to be a big part of what we do. You get your service on Wednesday or Friday, and then on Sunday, show up ready to make ministry happen for other people. And he said, Chase, that sounds awesome. What's it going to, it's going to take about 50 grand. Floor's about 25 grand, light's about 10 grand, sound about 10. I mean, it, you start adding it up, it's going to take it. And we can do it. Come on, somebody, we can do it. We've done it here. Because kids and students in our neighborhood need good environments that will shape them the way they talk, the way they think, what they believe. And we can provide those. Not alone, but together. Right? The third thing we want to do is save one month of operating expenses. Because I don't know, you know, what's going to happen in the world, but I know it's good to have a cushion. So that when times get tough, ministry doesn't have to stop. So that when times get tough, we can look out with concern, not in with concern. So that's number three. And then number four, as we always do, we set aside a part of Champions Give to give out to local organizations, missions organizations throughout the country and throughout the world. Champions Give this year is going to help us rise up and influence our neighborhood, our community, families, kids, Students, youth. So here's what I want to invite you to do. Now, again, let your light shine. You're not doing it alone. Let y'all's light shine. Let's do it together. Let's stand up and say, I'll do my part. Let's link arm in arm and make a difference because I don't have 200 grand. If you do, come see me after service. But together... Those in the room, those watching online, we can do all sorts of things. And again, everything we hope to do is what we hope to do depending on how Champions Give goes. And so I want to encourage you and invite you to be a part. How can you be a part? In the back of the seat in front of you, there's a commitment card. Would you grab that commitment card? <laughs> Even if you don't intend to take it home, just so you know. Just, just take it home. Make me feel good, okay? Okay. Here's the way we're doing Champions Give this year. Every year we set aside a Sunday in December. It's going to be December 12th this year as our Champions Give Sunday. And in October, I preach a message, tell you what we want to do, and we spend the next six or eight weeks preparing so that on that Sunday in December, that Champions Give Sunday, we bring our offering. This year we're going to do that. We're going to do the same. But we're going to extend it. We're going to make it a 12-month commitment. Not, not like pledges or whatever, but just a 12-month commitment. Because what happens is folks who want to give more, they need more than six or eight weeks to get there. And the commitment is not to get more out of people that already give big. The commitment is to let everybody participate in a significant way. Somebody might say, I can't bring 5,000 on December 12th, but I can, I can give an extra 100 every week and get that same 5,000. And so our ask this year, or, or what we're doing this year, is that you go talk to God. I'm not asking you to give. I'm asking you to go talk to God. Ask him how you should participate. Figure out what he says. And like I always say, if he gives you a number and it feels like it's too high, don't rebuke the devil. <laughs> the devil's not going to tell you to give big. But think about, what can I do? See, we underestimate what we can do in the short term. You can do a lot in a year. $50 a week is a tremendous, significant gift. We underestimate what we can do a little bit at a time. And then what we're going to do on Champions Give Sunday, December 12th, is some people might just say, hey, I'm, I'm bringing it all like I do every year. I budget for this. I plan for this. Here's my check or whatever, and this is, this is my part. That's going to be amazing. I encourage that. 
because if we can get all that money right up front, we're able to do these rooms and do all this stuff in January and we're ready by February, right? Or if you're saying, I'm making a 12-month commitment, which, which is amazing. Don't look at this as option B. This is, this is what we're doing. Bring your first part. Bring your best part on December 12th. And that day, we're going to have a celebration. We're going to give. Some will give their whole commitment that day. Some are going to bring their first part, their best part. But whatever we give, we're going to come together. We're going to pray blessing over it. We're going to pray that it meets all the needs that we have, the vision that we have, that it moves us forward, and that this community will be forever changed because we come together in distinction. It's distinct to give to the kingdom of God to believe in the power of the local church. We're gonna come together in the power of our distinction and together have an influence in this house for our community. Come on, somebody. So take that card home today. Be praying. Talk to God. See what he wants you to do. And on December 12th, we'll kick it off together. You know, I'm grateful for the church. I've been raised in God's house. There are people that attend champions and call me pastor that were my Sunday school teachers whenever I was a kid, and I'm grateful for them. My life has forever been shaped and changed because of the environment of the church. Youth services on Wednesdays, Fridays, Sundays. I started preaching in a youth service at 12 years old. What you see on a stage is the product of the environment of God's house. And I'm not holding myself up high. I'm just saying that the church can make a difference in a life. And I know that it's making a difference in kids' lives over there right now. My kid's over there. And he loves to worship. And he loves Jesus. And it's, it's because of the church. And what I didn't know whenever I was a kid, maybe what I didn't appreciate whenever I was a teenager, was that somebody made those environments possible for me. It didn't just happen. Somebody made it happen. Somebody gave so that it could be possible, so that my life could be forever changed. And now that I know that, I have a responsibility to stand up and say, it's, it's not gonna end with me. I'm gonna shape the environment of God's house for the future for the kids, for the grandkids. Maybe you weren't raised like me. And a lot of your struggle with church and with God is because of who raised you or how they raised you or whatever it may be. You have an opportunity to stand up and change that for your kids and change that for other people's kids and make a difference. What I'm saying is, as adults, whom God has blessed and God has saved, we have an opportunity, nay, a responsibility to stand up in the power of the goodness of God and make it happen for the next generation. Because I don't just want a strong church 28 years ago. I don't just want a strong church right now. I want a strong church in this community until the day Jesus comes back. May it be said of us what was said of the church in the first generation. These are those that turn the world upside down. Come on, church. Let's turn a neighborhood upside down. Let's turn, turn a community upside down. Let's turn a city upside down. Let's turn the nation upside down. Let's turn the world upside down. Let's not outsource our influence. Let's rise up in distinction. Let's rise up in influence and turn the world upside down.